All right, guys, so this video here is going to be a very important one because in this one here, I'll be talking about how financial markets and specifically the stock market is not perfectly efficient. And therefore, as a result of that fact, it can be exploited to generate outsized returns. And so essentially in this video, I'll be walking you guys through a few different examples throughout history that will refute the age old claim or the age old theorem about financial markets called the efficient market hypothesis. And this theorem or this assumption about the stock market is still widely regarded as true and accurate even today by many professors, including the ones I had to learn from back in my time in college, um, other economists and financial theorists, etc. And the reason why this stuff is so important, basically the reason why I'm making this video is because, you know, if this theorem was actually true, then technically speaking, it would be impossible to beat the market. But as you'll see in the examples throughout this video, that is certainly not the case. And therefore, every retail trader, including yourself, does have the power and the ability to beat the market. Now, real quick though, before we dive in, in case you guys are interested in getting some free stock or quite literally some free money, I've got some very cool opportunities and promotions in the description of this video, so check them out below. Right, for example, if you want 200 bucks of free stock from Tastyworks or a bunch of free stocks from Webull, free money from SoFi, etc., then again, check out the links in the description of this video. And secondly, in case any of you are brand new to the channel, again, my name is Scott, and I just wanna let you know that you can also find me on Skillshare as well where you can take my very detailed classes on options trading or stock market investing. And you'll also find some links to a few of my introductory courses in the description of this video as well. So be sure to check them out. And when you sign up for Skillshare using any of those links, you'll get a full one month free trial. All right, so first up here, what exactly is this efficient market hypothesis? Well, essentially there are three different forms of it, but they all boil down to saying basically the exact same thing. And that is, Stock market prices are basically always true and accurate. They reflect all known information about a particular company, and therefore it's impossible to consistently outperform the market by using any information the market already knows. And you know, having said that, it's probably not too difficult to believe that possibly could be true because, for example, when a company has an earnings announcement or just when some news article comes out about a company, you will typically see the stock price react almost instantaneously. So again, as a result of that, it's probably not too far-fetched to see why a lot of people think this efficient market hypothesis is actually true. And also, of course, do keep in mind that the track record of most hedge funds and most individual retail traders and investors, right, the majority of people do drastically underperform the benchmark indexes like the S&P 500. So again, this is all just more reasoning why the efficient market hypothesis could actually be true. But that being said, with such a huge blanket claim about how financial markets work, all it takes is one example to disprove the entire thing. And so again, in this video, I'm not gonna show you just one example, I'll show you three. And so for the first example, let's take a walk back in history all the way back to the early 2000s during the dot-com bubble. And in particular, we'll take a look at the Palm spinoff from the 3Com parent company. So basically during the year 2000, there was a company called 3Com which sold computer network systems and services and also owned a subsidiary company called Palm. So, you know, perhaps you've heard of Palm Pilots, which basically were the first iterations of handheld computers way before the iPhone or other smartphones became mainstream. And so on March 2nd of the year 2000, 3Com sold 5% of its stake in Palm to the public through an IPO. And then pending IRS approval, 3Com planned to spin off the remaining 95% of shares to the public later that year. And so basically the way this full spinoff would work is for every existing shareholder of 3Com, those shareholders would receive 1.5 shares of Palm for each one share of 3Com that they owned. So for example, if currently you own, let's say, two shares of 3Com before the spinoff, then after the spinoff occurred and Palm became a totally separate company, then at the time you would also receive three shares of Palm, right? Because again, two shares of 3Com times 1.5 equals three shares of Palm. So at that point in total, you would still have your original two shares of 3Com and then now three shares of Palm because again, these two companies now became totally separate. So therefore, this also means that when 3Com did issue that first 5% of Palm shares through an IPO, that means the 3Com shares should have been at least 1.5 times the price of Palm shares. Now, the day before the Palm IPO, the price of 3Com closed at $104.13 per share. And then the next day when the IPO occurred and 5% of Palm was issued to the public, the price of Palm closed at $95.06 per share. 
So therefore, doing the basic math here, multiplying that share price of Palm by 1.5, that means the price of 3Com should have jumped to at least $142.59. But instead, what actually happened? On that day of the IPO, 3Com shares fell to $81.81. .81. So ultimately here, that means the what's called the stub value of 3Com, basically the value of 3Com independent of POM just by itself. The stub value should have been taking the difference between the expected share price of 3Com of 142.59 minus the price of POM of 95.06, therefore giving you $47.53. Right, basically that should have been the implied share price of 3Com completely independent of POM. But of course, in actuality, with 3Com closing that day at $81.81, .81, that means if we subtract from that the expected price, the price it should have been of $142.59, we actually get a negative stub value of negative $60.78. So bottom line, what this means is the market at that time was quite literally giving the 3Com parent company a negative valuation. And so, of course, naturally, this makes absolutely no sense because especially with 3Com at the time, this was a profitable company. They had revenue, patents, infrastructure, employees, office space, etc. So all their assets together basically should have at least given them a valuation of more than zero for sure. But in this case, we can see here a completely blatant and mathematical example that the markets completely screwed up the accurate pricing of two individual companies. And then, as you might expect, the people who were able to take advantage of this gross mispricing, which, by the way, lasted for many, many months. This was not like a split second thing or a mispricing that just vanished after a few minutes. This lasted for many, many months. And so, again, the people who took advantage of that situation made a huge amount of money. And so that's our first example. But now let's fast forward to recent times and talk about the GameStop short squeeze of 2021. And so, as I'm sure many of you recall, this stock last year, early last year, went from a price of around 15 bucks per share and exploded all the way to almost 500 bucks per share in the span of just a few days. And keep in mind, right, that nothing fundamental about GameStop actually changed at all. And yet the efficient market hypothesis says that market prices or stock prices should at all times reflect the true value of that particular company. So really, the short squeeze of GameStop back in 2021 had nothing to do with the actual company itself, the fundamental value of that company, but it had everything to do with a select group of traders, mostly in Wall Street bets and elsewhere, that simply took advantage of a blatant opportunity in the market, right? And that opportunity was the huge amount of short interest on GameStop stock. You know, so many people were short the actual stock itself, hedge funds and other retail traders as well, because everybody assumed GameStop was going to go bankrupt during COVID. But again, all it took was a few retail traders to take advantage of that huge amount of short interest, which, by the way, is publicly known information, and start bidding the price of the stock higher. And in doing so, they knew full well that by bidding the price of the stock higher, they were eventually going to blow out a lot of short stock positions. And when that happens, the way short sellers have to cover their positions and basically cut their losses is by buying the stock, which of course creates more buying pressure, thus pushing the stock price up even higher and blowing out even more short selling positions. And ultimately, this created a chain reaction of more and more short sellers having to buy the stock and therefore causing the stock price to simply explode. And of course, just like with the 3Com spinoff back in the dot-com bubble, the profit potential with the GameStop short squeeze was absolutely enormous as well. And in fact, many people who did hop on the train at the beginning became multi-millionaires overnight. And then finally here, let's also talk about in general option pricing, in particular about implied volatility. And so this concept here is really the main reason why I pretty much only sell options. And for those of you who are not aware, implied volatility is basically a measurement of uncertainty about a particular stock's future. And this measurement is used in part to price an option contract. And from what I've seen through my own research or the research from places like Tasty Trade, implied volatility is overstated more than 80% of the time. So essentially, this means the market's expectation of where a stock will be in the future is usually way overblown. And as a result, this has the effect of making options overpriced the vast majority of the time. And really, this means there is an embedded edge in being an option seller, right? You always want to sell something that has an overpriced valuation. Now, that being said, this edge is definitely not huge. It's not going to make you a multimillionaire overnight like with GameStop or with 3Com, but it's still an edge nonetheless. 
And so ultimately, all this is to say, or all these examples are to say that there are still today mispricings in the market that can be taken advantage of or other embedded opportunities in certain asset pricing structures like options, for example, or other market events, investor sentiment, etc. And therefore, market pricing is definitely not perfectly efficient like the efficient market hypothesis would have you believe. And so then the bottom line becomes here that it is possible to outperform the market. And the most iconic example of that, of course, is Warren Buffett. Right, for example, if you look at the historical average returns for his fund, Berkshire Hathaway, the average annual return of that fund is more than 20%, which is also more than double the average return of the S&P 500 during the exact same time period. And so while, of course, beating the market is definitely not an easy task, right? As I mentioned earlier, most people, most hedge funds do underperform the S&Ps. It is still at least possible to do so because, again, markets are not actually perfectly efficient and accurate with their pricing. And so with that being said, that's going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And please let me know your thoughts or if you have questions in the comment section below. And don't forget, if you want some free stock or some free money, then check out the cool opportunities and promotions in the description of this video. And also, if you have an interest in taking some detailed classes on options trading or stock market investing, then check out my Skillshare courses. Links also in the description of this video. And finally, if you enjoyed this video, then please give it a thumbs up, drop a comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I drop new videos every single week, and you don't want to miss out. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.